Greetings, I'm Chris McLean, and it's my privilege to serve as the lead pastor at Shady Grove United Methodist Church in Short Pump, Virginia. And I'm delighted to welcome you to worship today. We are celebrating the third Sunday of the Easter season. As we get started, I want to share a little bit about Shady Grove. Uh, Shady Grove is a church uh, where we take seriously that all members are ministers. We know that God means to be working through us and that God works in unique ways through each person, and that includes you. And so you are called into ministry. So welcome ministers to worship this morning. As we get started, just a couple of announcements to help folks be able to get connected. This is an important time for us to be using our church website. The website is at www.shadygroveumc.net, uh, www.shadygroveumc.net. When you're there, uh, there will be one link that says things to do, and if you click that, it will give you a list of opportunities uh, while you might find yourself staying at home during this coronavirus season. Um, also, there's an area on the website called what's happening that has a lot of important information as well and so i hope you'll look there for opportunities you're going to find chances to be involved in zoom conversations most any day of the week uh, there are opportunities for some of our sunday school classes are getting together for kids so if your kids want to be looped into sunday school contact our church administrator frank so he can get you hooked up to one of those opportunities there's a lot going on and we want you to be able to stay connected during this time also, a new study is starting. I'm working with a small group studying the book, uh, The Good and Beautiful Community by James Bryan Smith. Uh, we are just on this Sunday, the 26th at five o'clock, meeting to organize a little bit. And then we'll read the first chapter and start that the next Sunday. This is a perfect chance to jump on board. So contact me and I'll be able to share the Zoom link with you for that opportunity. Now let's give ourselves to God in worship. Hi, Hi. my name is Henley Beach, and these are my sisters, Allie and Emmy, and we are going to sing I Will Be Glad and sing songs to God and a little bit of Jesus Loves Me. I will be glad and sing songs to God. I will be glad. joining me this morning for the children's moment. I'm so glad you're here. I've invited a friend to join us this morning. Maximilian, are you here? Here he is. Hi. I'm okay. How you doing, Maximilian? I'm great. Thank you. Well, good. I know Maximilian would love it if all of y'all say hi to him this morning. I know he would love that. So say hi real loud so he can hear it. Oh, that was great. He, we heard that. That was wonderful. So I invited Maximilian here this morning so that, as I wanted to see if you'd be willing to help me this morning, Maximilian. Will you help me? Yes, I can. Great. So what I want to do is to draw a picture of you. Oh, boy. I've always wanted to be a work of art. That's awesome. Well, here is today's your chance. Yippee. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a picture right here of Maximilian with my eyes closed. Well, yeah, I'm uh, going to draw a picture with my eyes closed. Are you sure, Miss Kate? 
I, That's a good idea to draw a picture with your eyes closed. Well, I think it's a great idea. In fact, Maximilian, I think that they might want to hang it up over at the Center for Creative Arts for those people over there to see it. Uh, I don't know about that. Well, Maximilian, Million, you sound a little bit hoarse this morning. <laughs> oh, hoarse! <laughs> no, it's just the pollen. Well, I'm glad it's just the pollen and that you're well. Okay, well, I'm going to get started. So, I've got my marker here. Okay, and so I'm going to close my eyes. And um, what I think I'm going to have to hold it right here. Can y'all see it? And hold it here. Can y'all see it? Okay, so I'm going to close my eyes. And let's see, I'm going to close my eyes. So you can see my eyes are closed. So I'm going to draw a circle here. Does that look like his face? And then let's, she needs a big nose. Big nose? And let's see, an eye here. And he has two eyes, right? So an eye here. And what about two ears? An ear here and an ear here. And then what else does he need? Does he need like a hat? He has some kind of hat. Um, what else? Oh, his glasses. He always wears glasses. Okay. Yeah, the glasses have two things for that, and that comes around like that, and that's like that. All right. How does that look? Okay. Yeah, that's about done. Okay, back to me. What do you think? Uh, and, and look. What do y'all think? Uh, Miss Kate. Yeah. It looks something like a chicken tried to draw it. Well, I don't know about that, not civilian. But the reason that I drew this is to show that it's really hard to draw something and do things with your eyes closed. And I don't think that can, thing can go in the center. Well, we'll see. Miss Sue is really nice. She is nice. Okay. But she's got eyes. That are open. Yes. Well, our story today, our Bible lesson today, after is about after Jesus had risen and he was walking on the road with a couple of men who were talking about Jesus and they didn't know that that was Jesus that were walk that was walking with them. So, right. They were talking with Jesus about Jesus, but they didn't know it was Jesus. That's exactly what happened. They did not know it was Jesus until their eyes were opened. Sort of like nobody could recognize me from that picture you drew. <laughs> well, they couldn't recognize that it was Jesus. That's right. Because they, even though they saw him, they couldn't recognize him because they were not expecting to see him. And... I remember now this story. Jesus later broke bread with the disciples, and then they recognized him. That's exactly what happened. After the disciples had walked on the road, they asked Jesus to come back and stay with them that night, and he did. And when they were sitting around at the table, and Jesus broke the bread and gave it to the disciples, they were able to see that it really was Jesus. Their eyes were opened. And that reminds us that if we give thanks to God and we share what we have, then we are more able to see Jesus, right? That's right, Miss Kay. But, oh, can I ask you something? Sure, Maximilian. What would you like to ask me? Well, can I have that picture you drew of me? I oh. want to get rid, I mean... Uh, I'd like to put it someplace special, so special no one will ever get to enjoy it. Well, Maximilian, let me see. I, I think that, you know what, I think I can make a couple little adjustments here and make a couple little improvements on it. Let me see what I can do. I'm going to mark it right here, but this time I have my eyes open. How about that? All right, Better. Mark it. Yeah, I have okay. my eyes open. Okay, so my eyes are open. All right, so I've done that and that. All righty. So how about this? What do you think about that? Wow! That's what I call art. It looks just like me. Yeah. It's a masterpiece. All right, a masterpiece. Well, there you go. Okay, will you pray with me? Yes. Dear God. Dear God. 
Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. Who reminds us. Who reminds us. To keep our eyes open. To keep our eyes open. So that we can see you. So that we can see you. Amen. Amen. Maximilian, thank you for being here with me this morning. Thank you for being here with me. All right. And I hope we'll keep our eyes open today. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your prayers? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. Our message this morning is recognizing Jesus, and this message is part of a series we're doing on building blocks of faith, and being able to recognize Jesus is one of those important building blocks. And there's a piece of a prose that talks about the life of faith with God uh, that a lot of people have heard, and it's Footprints in the Sand. And we're going to begin with that piece as we get into our message this morning, but first let us pray. Holy God, would you open our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that as your scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you would say to us this day. Amen. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him and he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I have noticed during the most troublesome time in my life there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you most, you would leave me. The Lord replied, My son, my precious child, I love you and would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Footprints is a popular piece of prose about the faith life uh, because it deals with a difficulty uh, in the life of faith, which is how we feel during times of trouble um, and how that differs from ways we might feel when life is going well. And so there are times in life where we easily know the two footprints, uh, two sets. Um, we have this sense that we are moving through life with God, and that can be a very positive time in the life of faith. And we know just who Jesus is in those times, but then there are times uh, when we're going through difficulty, and very often when we go through times of difficulty, we may feel isolated, alone, confused. Our relationship with God might seem to have just gone dark, like the power is out, things are quiet, and we can't hear God, and we're not confident that God can hear us. Things might feel kind of empty, and we might characterize those times as those one set of footprint times. Um, we might say, gosh, you know, every time I felt that sense of isolation, like I had to walk this journey alone, it was during the hard times when I needed you most. And so this piece of prose raises that question and it allows 
an answer from God that might invite us to recognize God, not just in good times, but in difficult times as well, when it raises this question, you know, don't you know that's when I was carrying you? And so that word recognize, um, it's helpful to take it apart. There's the re part and the cognize part. And that root cog, meaning no, and re meaning again, uh, to recognize someone is to know them again. Um, maybe you've seen someone before and now you're in a different context and you're able to recognize them in some different context. You get to know them again. Uh, but we also have another definition for that word recognize. Um, and it's one where we recognize, say, authority or recognize a law uh, where we uh, give some credit um, to a reality. And so do we recognize the hope that God gives us in these dark times? Do we recognize um, the authority of good news to bring us hope when we feel uncertain? Can we see Jesus with us in uncertain times? Uh, so I want to give you just a moment to reflect before we move on, and I want to put a question before you. And the question is, um, in that positive way that the footprint story brings out, that question is, when have you recognized Jesus? Were you able to look back on a time that felt hard, but as you look back, you could see that perhaps God was with you after all. So when have you recognized Jesus? I don't know about you, but I got to have an outing this week. That was exciting. Uh, for my outing, I got to go to the allergy office and I didn't have to go for shots. So nobody was poking me. It was just a chance to have a conversation with my allergist and talk about some symptoms and figure out, you know, have we done enough to treat for pollen or mold and all that sort of thing. And in the process of that discussion, we start talking seriously about antacids and talking about how some symptoms that people get from allergies uh, are also the same kinds of seeming symptoms that you get from acid reflux and it can be hard to tell which is which and so because of that conversation I've had heartburn on my mind and that's a lens uh, through which I'm looking at the message this week and scripture this week and I started thinking about this idea of uh, spiritual heartburn what is a spiritual heartburn I think spiritual heartburn is happening every time we begin to really question faith and we say wow you know is this faith is it helping me is it good for anything or we might say you know I'm sure there's something really useful about faith but maybe I just don't get it um, I'm struggling here and those times come uh, when we face disappointment when we face loss, disillusionment, uh, when things seem to be slipping away. And that's guaranteed to happen. I mean, I don't think anybody who seriously engages, even just trying to go about ministry, if you're, you're that part of your life where you're trying to offer yourself as Christ to others, I bet you if you do that long enough, you're gonna have a time where you say, Lord, how did I get here? How did I get in this place? How did I get in this situation? How did I get in these relationships? Uh, how did I get in the midst of this misunderstanding? Um, how did I get into this hurting? Um, so there are gonna be these hard times, whether it's uh, a ministry, a loss of relationship, or just those things we're trying to do to be faithful in living our lives and using our gifts and caring for our families, like our jobs, you know, really disillusioning things can be happening at work. And for a lot of people really are happening at work right now. I know a lot of folks um, have lost jobs or know that they might be on that next list and possibly be getting ready to lose jobs. So maybe it's a good time to talk about spiritual heartburn because it's real. Okay, so let's make that heartburn connection with the scripture this morning. We find ourselves on the road to Emmaus with two disciples uh, who the last they knew about Jesus was that he had died on the cross and been laid in the tomb. Um, the movement that was around Jesus and his followers was uh, dead with him. Uh, and this is what happens. Uh, read along in your Bible, Luke 24, 13 to 35. Hear the word of God. 
Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked Jesus, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did not find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said Jesus was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. They urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over, and so Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke the bread, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? There it is. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road? and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I've had some pretty fun conversations with my brother lately. Um, one of them, my brother was telling about his way of praying every day and he calls it the prayer sandwich. And the prayer sandwich is, uh, he gets in his truck in the morning before he heads to work and he prays the Lord's prayer right there in his truck before he does anything. And then all during the day while he's at work, he just has sort of an ongoing conversation with God. And when he gets back home in the driveway, uh, he prays the Lord's Prayer again. And that's his prayer sandwich. And so if you don't have um, a daily prayer pattern, this is actually a great way to start. So I, I commend that to you. And the other thing we talked about in that conversation uh, that was so helpful is he began to talk about disappointment and he said that when he was standing on the outside of faith and just thinking about faith and, and having questions about God um, and questions for God, um, one of the things that just didn't seem right to him was sharing disappointments with God. It just seemed that if you're going to talk to God that maybe just praise was the thing to do, but that he had learned at his church the importance of being honest with God about his disappointments and that that was something he was giving a try. And so I commend that to you as well, because it's something that we find in our scripture lesson this morning. We find these disciples uh, trying to process what happened with Jesus, what happened in Jerusalem, and they are just openly processing that. Uh, there's a stranger that joins them. It happens to be Jesus. They can't see it. Uh, and they're walking along. 
and just talking about all they're going through. And that's what's happening to us now when we get together. We say things like, oh, these are strange times and how are you doing? And, and we're trying to process disappointments. Um, you know, right now in our family, uh, we have a wedding happening among my husband's family, his cousin's getting married. And in the same family, one of the cousins uh, is headed to the hospital and, you know, perhaps has coronavirus. Um, and so there's a lot to process there, not just in our family, but in everybody's families. And so they're going through this processing of gut-wrenching difficulty, um, parsing through their heartburn. And Jesus comes up alongside them, asks questions and listens with them. And then Jesus helps them to the hope that they couldn't see. And so we connect to that definition of recognize, right? They didn't recognize Jesus. And we remember that in that word recognize, it has that R-E beginning, re, meaning doing something again. Um, they, after all of this disappointment, after all this difficulty, they had to learn uh, with Jesus's help how to know Jesus again, how to recognize him, how to know Jesus again. Uh, how to know hope again, how to understand what was the good news Jesus was sharing with them in the middle of what seemed like this incredibly dark time. Uh, so that's what happens on this walk. And it hints at it, you know, so there's all this detail about bread and walking and who asked what. And, um, but then we get to this one part where we most want the detail and then it's not there. Um, it's this part where it says Jesus began to walk them through and starts with Moses and the prophets and goes through. And we're like, oh, well, fill it in, fill it in right there and tell us boom, boom, boom. Uh, because what happens is their hearts are burning within them. And this time it's not that acid reflux, I'm so stressed out kind of pain. This time it's the, the wow, you know, can't you just tell how true that is, how important that is, how touching that is, how restoring that is, how renewing that is, that new perspective. <gasps> my heart was burning the whole time. Some part of me was knowing again hope, right? Recognizing hope. And so they began to recognize hope and how Jesus was explaining the big picture to them that they weren't able to see at that time as they were moving through this pain and disappointment. And Jesus puts all of that pain and disappointment into a context and their hearts are singing and resonating with this telling that Jesus is giving. Friends, if Jesus joined you on a walk, what would he hear you discussing and struggling to understand. And what conversation do you need to have with Jesus? On account of coronavirus, um, our internet and cable provider decided to give us some free channels this week. And so due to those free channels and getting to enjoy them on cable, uh, my husband and I have been able to catch up on a lot of James Bond movies. Um, and I actually didn't pay very good attention, so I don't know which one it was. But in one of them, uh, you see James Bond having to climb this incredible sheer um, mountain face. I mean, there's just no place to grab onto. He's having to put metal pieces into the rock and, and make ties to secure himself and hook one thing to the next. It's just this incredible feat. Um, later his friends kind of run up and help him and you wonder to yourself how did they easily get up where they could run and help him um, if he had to climb this whole thing but never mind that um, what we learn in this climbing process um, is that sometimes the terrain that we're on in life is so complicated we're not able to easily put one foot in front of the other all we can do is just hold on to this piece and hold on to this piece. And in the life of faith, when we have that, that uh, uncomfortable kind of spiritual heartburn and we have deep questions about 
uh, where is God in this? Is God with me or not? When we're in the midst of that, one of the things we can do is just, you know, we're on that rock face and recognize that we are holding on to this piece and this piece. Um, and so we hold on above all to the uh, knowledge that God is good, um, that God loves and wants good for us, that God has sent Jesus into the world, God's own self here to help us, hold us, love us, move us through to a life that really is life and show us how to live that, not just in heaven. Now, some people have the idea that all the good stuff just happens in heaven, but what we have um, is God with us. And anytime that we're with God, we're already in that place called heaven. We are in the kingdom when we are in the presence of God and so we get to live in the presence of God already. We get to live kingdom hope already in this life. We get to live heaven in the real world. Um, and sometimes we're living that on the edge of a rock face, um, getting uh, to a big high place that's hard to get to. Um, and we just have to hold on tight to some key things um, like God is good, God is with us. And so that's why I came out to the playground because we start at, a, at an early age learning to climb these kinds of things. Um, we can't step everywhere, but we can step on one solid place after another and hold on to one solid piece after another. Something important happens for us in the life of faith when we can get those footholds. Um, we can see that just in the example of James Bond. When he got the rest of the way up that sheer uh, rock face, the perspective he had at the top was incredible. And we, in life, we, in the midst of some of the small things we're dealing with, we might feel like we're out on that playground holding on to this, holding on to that, and and getting up a, a few steps and getting a little bit of a new perspective. But every now and then the thing we're facing in life is like that sheer rock face. And we know that Jesus faced that sheer rock face that was called death. Uh, think about the fear people had of death, the fear people had of political and military power, the, the fear that people had of just the way the world is always going to be and it's never going to change and so we just have to get with it and cope all of those kinds of fears that press down on us fears of illness fears of loss they are that sheer rock face and they are the things that make us wonder where is god if we're going through the midst of these difficulties and these sufferings and jesus goes through suffering climbing holding on that god is good God is with us and gets all the way to the top and there's that new perspective and that new perspective up at the top, that's resurrection, life, that's kingdom perspective. And so Jesus was inviting the disciples to understand where these different rock holds were. And so in this conversation where he walks through Moses and the prophets and, and helps them understand it, he's helping them find all those things to hold on to. God is good. God is with us. God loves us. God is working through us. God will work all things for good. And so all of this is happening in their learning with Jesus and is happening with us also in our learning with Jesus. Uh, we might wish that we had sort of the cliff notes of everything Jesus said to them, but maybe it's a gift that we don't. What we have in the scripture is an invitation. We see that these disciples had a conversation with Jesus and discovered key pieces to hold on to until they got to that new perspective. Um, and we know this happens in life. Um, one of the things I laugh about is um, a thing that uh, people say about women as they get older, um, that women just speak their mind more and more as they get older. And I don't know if that's true for everybody, but I've laughed and said a lot of times, boy, I'm looking forward to that. You know, when I get to my 50s, when I get to my 60s, look out. And the reason we might be able to do that is because we have gotten older, gotten wiser, and learned what mattered and what didn't, and the thing that just consumed us. And we just thought, oh, God, if this doesn't happen for me, you're just not with me at all. And we might get down in life and say, oh, I just didn't realize God knew better for me. God has been with me. Um, we just get a different perspective. And that happens as we climb those rock faces of life with Jesus. He's the one telling us, we're, hold here, hold here, come the way I've come. And then you'll see 
from this higher perspective that death is not the end, that sickness is not in charge, that fear does not need to run our lives. We can live free in the kingdom. We can live heaven in the real world already right now. God is with us and we can live that heavenly life. And so that's why Jesus was showing us how to give ourselves in love for others. When we do what Jesus did, we'll run up against the dangers Jesus ran up against. He was misunderstood, he was vilified, he suffered, and we may. And in the end, the kingdom way of living triumphs. That's Easter. That is the hope, the perspective that we begin to discover through Jesus as we learn to recognize Jesus, not just in good times, but also in the difficult, in the moving through the hard things. Uh, so I want to share with you some things uh, that Will Willimon has said um, that I thought were very moving about this passage. He said, today's lesson stresses that the risen Christ is the same as the crucified Christ. The risen Christ is the same as the crucified Christ. And then he says, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is the one who wins victories through suffering, who lifts up the downtrodden and the oppressed, who will not allow the victims of evil and injustice ultimately to be crushed. In the end, no matter what evil is done, God will get God's way with the world. And he says, Easter is true. And that's the hope we're holding on to, that God is going to get God's way with the world. And so we keep moving through. We love like Jesus loved. We serve as Jesus served. We keep following the way of Christ, knowing that God will get God's way with the world in the end. And so we continue to serve unafraid. Willimon says, Jesus Christ is none other than the full revelation of God. And through him, now we know who God is, what God looks like, and what God wills for us and the world. He says, if Easter is true, then never again are we permitted to lose heart, to despair, to give up. If God transformed the evil, bloody crucifixion into a grand triumph, well, who knows what God can do with our setbacks and our dead ends, our failures and frustrations. No place is beyond the reach of God's redeeming grace if Easter is true. He says, if Easter is true, then it's a lie that death is the last word, the final act, the end. If Easter is true, then it isn't over until God says it's over. If Easter is true, then our end is really our beginning. At the end, when this life is over, we are given not oblivion, darkness, and despair, but a future, a new birth, a new beginning, if Easter is true. If Easter is true, then we are not left alone. The risen Christ came back to the very disciples who disappointed and betrayed him. And Christ gathered these depressed, despairing, and bereft individuals and forms them into a new family, a community, the church. We who are taught by our culture to think of ourselves as competitive, lonely, and contentious individuals, each looking after ourselves, each seeking our own self-interest, we are the church, Christ's body, the visible presence of the risen Christ in the world, if Easter is true. If Easter is true, then you don't have to climb up to God, and you don't have to think hard and go through all sorts of mental gymnastics in order to be close to God. And bread and wine, right here at table, God comes close to you. God comes close to you. Easter is true. That's a piece for us to hold on to. And when we hold on to it, we find ourselves increasingly able to recognize Christ, recognize Jesus with us now, and helping us into a future that is whole. Sitting at table and uh, thinking about recognizing Jesus um, reminds me of a time when, I guess I was about a tween, and my older sister and the rest of my family and I went out to Rockola Cafe in Virginia Beach for dinner. And in the middle of the dinner, my sister saw a group at another table and the waiters and waitresses are just all over them over there. And my sister says, that's you too. It is, I, I recognize them. 
And, you know, in the scripture, the disciples don't recognize Jesus until Jesus walks them through. And this situation is a little different. My sister recognizes you too. And then the waiters and waitresses try to convince her that she hasn't seen them. It's just some sort of look-alike band or something like that. Uh, and so ultimately my sister did not go ask for their autograph, but it wasn't because she doubted her recognition. She had some things to hold on to about who it is she was looking at. So she knew um, that she was seeing again um, people that she'd seen before, um, either in a video or on a cassette tape or a poster. She recognized him, but she didn't get that autograph because um, she'd accidentally uh, dropped a rib when she was eating ribs and had uh, barbecue sauce all the way down a white shirt. So um, that made it a little hard to want to go over and ask for an autograph when you accidentally have uh, dinner on your shirt. And that, yeah, that just happens here at table. At table is a place where maybe we recognize some things. We recognize the family that we love. We recognize the gifts that we have in life. We can recognize Jesus um, at table, not just you two. And so that's what happened for the disciples. They recognized Jesus when they got to table. Um, that interaction at table was one of those um, footholds, a handhold on even the sheer rock faces of life, um, that they knew how they could hold on um, and say, this is Jesus. Um, that part was so strong, what they experienced at table with Jesus um, in his life and now in his risen life. They experience it again and they say, I know who this is. And right now we're going through a time where we're not able to gather and celebrate communion together. And so we might miss being at table, but I encourage you to sit down um, at your table, at your meals, and think, um, think in terms of the sacrament when you sit down and eat. Um, think about what happens. When we come to table, we are bringing bread and cup, right, um, that are part of the fruit of our labors, maybe um, all the yeast is bought out of the grocery store. So I'm pretty sure some of you baked some bread. Uh, so we probably produced that bread or maybe we squeezed those grapes or got some of those blackberries that were on sale this week and that were really good. Um, so maybe we've brought um, this bread and this fruit of the vine. Maybe we've brought these things to the table. These are uh, represent our gifts and our offering. And that's what we do at communion, right? We bring um, our labor, ourselves, and we offer that symbolically as our whole selves offered to God. And God in Christ meets us at table. Um, God in Christ wants to be so close as to be in table fellowship with us and takes that bread and that cup that we brought for that shared meal and shares all the more by saying, this bread, it's my body, this, this cup, it, it's my blood, it's my life that I'm giving you. That's how much I love you and I'm with you. The one who went through so much suffering and came out alive says, I'm gonna feed you out of who I am, out of my own God life with you. I'm gonna feed you. And so we share in that meal with Jesus and we find God in us, fueling us, empowering us to live that kingdom hope now to keep climbing that sheer rock face because we've had bread, we've had cup, God is with us, and we get gradually and piece by piece in a new perspective because we recognize Jesus in these things and we realize how strong God is in the midst of everything we're facing. This week I invite you to keep a question with you. We've asked a couple this morning. The one I want you to keep with you is about recognizing Jesus. Um, right before I came to church to start filming some of this, I heard a story and I said, I, I recognize Jesus in that. And maybe you heard it. It's a story of a farmer in Kansas whose wife has one lung and the other lung um, has dealt with a lot of health issues and also diabetes. Um, and so here she is with compromised breathing in two ways and she's in this high risk category. And during this time of this pandemic, 
Uh, they happen to have for their farm some N95 masks that you can get sometimes at hardware stores or could. They had five and they have four members of their family. And the fifth one they sent to New York. They said it's never been used. Please give this to one of the health professionals who needs it. And so there's a, a small grouping of families in the country who are as at risk as this family is. And they had a small number of protective masks and did not keep more than they needed, but gave, moved into risk, into suffering to give all that they had to help the lives of others. It sounds like table, giving what we have, bringing what we have to the table, letting Christ bless it, use it for God's work in the world. It sounds like Jesus to me and that farmer in Kansas. Friends, I invite you to go out into the world, pay attention to where Jesus is You'll know because your heart will burn in the good way. You'll recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And as Jesus is helping you understand the story and the footholds and handholds to move you through difficult times, not only recognize, but recognizing Jesus in the world, then let Jesus work through you so that you can share Jesus in this world. Amen. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from my fears. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. 
delivered me He delivered me from my fears I'm not scared here I'm not scared here I'm not scared not scared
recognize Christ with you, Christ for you, Christ holding you, Christ in creation, Christ in your neighbors, Christ in strangers. May you recognize Jesus all around you and may others recognize Jesus in and through you. Amen.